Uh, well, actually, we do know that they drank a lot of alcohol during the medieval ages, and uh, it was considered, for instance, uh, a sin if you didn't. We believe that one third of the population in, in Norway uh, around the year 1000 AD was that they were slaves. Yeah, there's this saying that we're only nine meals away from anarchy. Yes, I'm a big fan of Ray Mears. Bjorn, go ahead, bra. <laughs> yeah, they go bra. Thank. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I succeeded in my Norwegian. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to start by saying what an absolutely stunningly beautiful country Norway is. It's what, nicer, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wonderfully um, kind and hospitable people. Uh, I've been fortunate to. My first trip to Norway was with the Marines when we, we went up to um, Yende, Yendesheim was where we stayed and we did our Arctic warfare training up, up in the north. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I, I, I learned one of my passions in life, which I, I haven't done for years, but it's uh, cross-country skiing. Yeah, that's, I, I like that too, yeah. And then um, I was very fortunate to go back to Norway to study in Freya, which is near um, Lillehammer. Mm. And I studied to be a development instructor to go and work as a volunteer in Africa. So I, I taught um, street children for six months in Mozambique. But I, wow. but I but that, That's wonderful. Yeah. But that involved living in Norway for six months on top of a mountain. Uh, in, a, mm. in a ski lodge. It was just an old ski lodge hotel. It was brilliant. Um, skiing every day, every day. Um, sauna, sauna. Mm. Um, they went back to Norway and I chopped fish in a salmon factory. Lax, okay. lax. Um, Ducks, salmon, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I lived in Norway for a about a year that time uh, on an island called Freya, which is just next to Trondheim. And wow, what a great year. Not that I remember a lot because we drank a lot of moonshine. Okay. <laughs> um, so maybe we can talk about that because that's a phenomenon in, in England or in the UK we don't have because alcohol is so cheap here. Um, they virtually like throw alcohol on you and it and it's mm. well let's start with that it's very different isn't it in um in scandinavian culture it it, it it's we were talking about jantelagen um yes uh jantelagen the law of janta that's uh, basically uh it, it comes from a book by axel sandemose he was Danish actually, but he moved to Norway uh, and became a Norwegian novelist. Uh, and it was, um, it's a law that uh, it's not a law, but it's he 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 said that in his novel there was like this law that said that you you should not think you're better than anyone. You should not. Uh, yeah, basically, you, you shouldn't think that you're better than anyone else. Now, I hear that all the time, especially from the USA, actually. <laughs> uh, that's the worst sin uh, of all sins, uh, I understand. But um, it's a law, again, like law, I'm doing this with my fingers, um, fiction, fictionist law that's designed to keep people down so that they don't excel in life. And that's what we see a lot, sadly, in, in Norway and in many other countries as well. Um, it's, um, it is worse out in the countryside, I would say, than in the cities. And it, I'm sure that it was a lot worse back in the old days. Uh, 
uh, when Norway was much more divided into social classes than it is now. <clears throat> Do you think, so, yeah. um, I, mm. I first came across Jantelagen in Sweden, and it, yeah. it's, I had a Swedish girlfriend at the time, and she said it's, um, it's a, we'd call it unwritten law. So it's kind mm. of like, you know, in here and in the community, but it's not something that you can maybe read. And she said it, um, she said, it's like you can be successful, but you're not allowed to kind of go around telling everybody, hey, look at me, I'm, I'm the big cheese. Um, and, but the, the fascinating thing, and this is where it relates to UK culture, is the drinking. She said, at the weekend, you can get smashed. And in, in Scandinavia, I, I, I seem to remember most young people do, right? Well, but, sadly, but, we have a very unhealthy drinking culture uh, in Norway. I am very glad that alcohol ex is expensive here. Now, some people would say that, well, that leads to people drinking moonshine, which uh, is unhealthy, by the way. <laughs> people go blind sometimes, actually, permanently, um, and uh, smuggler spirit and so on. Uh, it's, um, but still, it, it keeps the total volume of, uh, of consumption down. Uh, lots of people, they want to disagree when I say that, but if you look at the numbers, it really does. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we do have lots of injuries, uh, people driving their car after they have had a few drinks and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's not good. You know, that's, that is actually one of the worst social problems, if I can use that term, uh, in Norway. Uh, I don't know why it's like that. Uh, but you mentioned we're not supposed to show off our wealth in, in this country. Uh, lots of people do. They, they, uh, and I, I, I noticed that lots of people who don't, they, they borrow money to do that. <laughs> and they build a house that's much too big for them. Uh, or for their their uh, wealth, which they don't really have. So you're not supposed to do that, but it's it's totally okay to go out and get uh, very very drunk uh, uh, on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's an odd thing, if you ask me. I don't drink alcohol myself. Um, so when you see me in my videos drinking beer, it's non-alcoholic beer, which I like. Yes, it's good. You, you can really get into the non-alcoholic beer. And, um, and for people who've, who've, who are trying to give up alcohol, I'd highly recommend it because when you've been off the beer for a few months and you have a non-alcoholic beer in, in, in the pub, it really does. It's, it's a quite a nice little treat and it kind of feels like you're drinking a bit beer. I mean, it, it, it helps get you by. But Bjorn, going back to the Jontelagen thing, I was more fascinated with the fact that that it's frowned upon to drink during the week, i.e. Yeah. during the working week in Scandinavia, whereas here you can drink whenever you want. I mean, many, many people now will drink one, if not two bottles of wine uh, an evening and and yes it is a, a form of alcoholism um but whereas when i would go in a bar in say i don't know oslo or, or stockholm and as the english guy it's like right who wants a beer the scandinavians would go um and they start looking at each other um yeah <laughs> Yeah, and you could see the difference in culture. They they didn't want to tell me, Chris, we don't drink here during the week. And I mm -hmm. I wondered I wondered Bjorn if this went back to the ancient cultures. So say say for for example, may, maybe the Vikings is not a, a, a good example, but Norway is very community based. 
um, has to function as a community. And I wonder if they recognised in the old days that if you were the guy drinking during the week, you're not going to be much good. You know, you're not going to build your house. You're not going to farm your farm. You're not going to build your ships. Uh, well, actually, we do know that they drank a lot of alcohol during the medieval ages. And uh, it was considered, for instance, uh, a sin if you didn't. And there were laws that said that uh, each uh, its farm had to, uh, had to brew ale for Christmas and so on. I can't remember the details on that, but it was the opposite. Uh, but then we got the, um, the Christian, um, um, what's it called? Uh, do you say? Um, Ethos? No. no, the Christian, uh, the, the purists. Uh, you know, um, and certain, well, several of those movements that were uh, anti-alcohol, you shouldn't drink at all. It was considered then, from then on, a sin. Um, and I think also meat consumption, interestingly, were frowned upon in, in certain uh, Christian uh, groups uh, or uh, fractions uh, but certainly alcohol was was not allowed at all uh, and i think it comes from that because there was a lot of drinking a lot of um people just ruined their lives completely and then uh, you had this alternative no, no no drink allowed at all which was a better alternative you know if if you had to choose between drinking every day, drinking a lot, spending all your money on drink and not drinking at all, obviously not drinking at all, is a better option. So uh, I think it comes from that. Um, and it's kind of stayed within the communities a li little bit up until today. Yes, that's fascinating. I'm trying to think of the name of that movement because you had the temperance movement, but I, I, I know... I know who you mean. Friends at home, put it in the comments. Um, yes, put it in the comments. So, Bjorn, your ancestry, I mean, your personal ancestry, does that go back to the Viking times? Would you, is yeah. that your sort of? Yeah, actually it does. Uh, and I'm, it, it's not very uncommon uh, for a Norwegian, but uh, I'm very lucky because someone, uh, one of my relatives uh, did, she is doing uh, research on our ancestry. So she's been able to find several of the lines, so to speak, back uh, up uh, through the family tree. Mm. Uh, I know that I am, for instance, a direct uh, descendant of uh, Egil Skallagrimsson. He was an Icelandic um, Poet, uh, <laughs> he was, um, yeah, I, I want to say poet and then say no more, but he <laughs> he was also a lot more than that. So he was a bit infamous in his time. Um, yeah, uh, and several other maniacs also. In the, in, I can find those in the family tree. Also, I do have uh, lin lineage to, to some, some Scottish kings, actually. Uh, which I found very interesting. Um, and uh, we know that the name Bull, B-U-L-L, -L, it comes from the British Islands uh, in the 1500s. So someone moved to Denmark from there and, and then after a few generations up to Norway. Wow. Yeah. So you might not believe this, but we, we're kind of related in a way because my saint surname Thrall, in I think in Norsk is is Trell, means slave. Yeah, uh, Trell means slave. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or, or surf. <clears throat> sur or surf. So my family history is we we were the lower, the lower class, the lower caste of Vikings. So you had your Viking warriors getting all the glory, and then you had your your, your, your thralls at the bottom but because we were the lower caste of viking culture 
I tell my girlfriend that we were we were still Vikings. <laughs> yeah, well, it it's uh, it was a um, uh, slavery was widespread, and uh, I've uh, we don't know for sure, but we believe that one third of the population in in Norway uh, around the year one thousand AD was that they were slaves. So th- that's a lot of people. So. Wow. Yeah. Gosh. Have have you been in Iceland? I have, yeah. It's in, it's an incredible land, isn't it? Yeah. Um it's uh very fascinating and very different from Norway when you look at the the, the scenery, the nature. Uh so they had to do quite a bit of uh they had to adapt to to that climate when they came came there. Uh but yeah, they were clever people. Was it warmer back then? No, I, I heard it was warmer back in those times. Uh, I've heard that it was warmer, and I've heard that it was this, about the same. It's. I don't think it was colder. Uh, we we found, and uh, I'm saying we. I, I I haven't, but you know the the archaeologists uh, have found uh, grain and other. Uh, I, I, some vegetables or traces of vegetables on Greenland so we know that they, they grew some vegetables there I honestly don't know uh, if they can do that now if it's warm enough some in, during the summer but it was warm enough back then uh, that it could have something to do with uh, the changing of the uh, ocean currents mm. that's just a guess uh, but that will also affect the climate along the coast of course so um, um, yeah I, I think it was a little bit warmer or this, about the same as now uh, and people use that an ex- as an example all the time they're saying well uh, we, human activity doesn't affect climate change or anything like that because look at the Viking Age. It was a lot warmer, but we don't really know that it was warmer or anything like that. We just know that they grew uh, plants to eat in areas where we, we can't grow plants to eat now. Uh, so uh, that, there you have it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um. I was going to say that brings us nicely on to bushcraft in respect yeah. in respect that when I was in Iceland, I, I ate, I don't know how you pronounce it, but in English you'd say horkel, harkel. It's uh, fermented shark. Yes. And of course you guys how have... How did that taste? <laughs> well, you guys have gravlax as well, right? Which is a similar... I don't like that. <laughs> So, friends at home, what we're talking about here is the ancient methods of preserving meat. Um, with fish. respect, yeah, yeah. Uh, meat and, and, and in this case, fish and shark. Mm. In Iceland, they take this shark, for, obviously, from the ocean, and it's so, um, it's got so much acid in it that, that the, it's buried in the ground for maybe a year. And then when you dig it up, it, it becomes edible. It certainly was. I, I, I ate everything over. I loved it. The sheep's brain. You did. Yeah. But then I, I've always, Bjorn, I made a rule when I was about nine that I was going to eat everything in my life and I've stuck to it. <laughs> so it's, it's made. Well, I, I can tell you, I, it's like every Christmas, especially around Christmas, we get all those strange foods and i don't want to insult anyone because some people love this but i think it's a little bit disgusting to be honest with you it's i mean we're talking about rotten fish here yeah <laughs> and and we haven't even in my mind an even worse uh sort of fish in norway that's the lutefisk which is uh have you tasted that yeah i had everything i think i yeah. I've tried everything. It's um, um, what's what's the opposite of acid? That's uh, alkaline. Base. Alkaline. Okay, so you treat fish with 
alkaline um, and you get the you, the fish becomes almost like jelly and when they they carry this out to the table and it's wobbling uh, I, I've never had it because of, no, Norwegians typically love lutefisk but around Christmas and they eat loads of it but I it's not for me <laughs> <laughs> when I worked in the fish factory all the workers would put at Christmas would put their order in for gravlax so so uh, rotten salmon <laughs> and yeah. I mean I'm gonna be honest it for people listening it's not it's not what you'd think a rotten fish would it, it comes out really nice I don't I don't know how they do it in a factory but they they do they it's a very popular uh order yeah. to, to to send out but yes the Swedes do have rotten fish and it's considered a delicacy uh it's the of now oh, I forgot um it's the one that it it is not allowed to open the can on a on airplanes. <laughs> um, yes. What's it called now? Um, yeah, it's the one where the the can itself will start to bulge because of the process going on inside, and the smell is supposed to be so bad that it can make people vomit, but. Again, I don't want to insult, especially not the Swedes, but it mm. that is rotten fish. That's what it is. Um, so, um, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in, <laughs> Asia, in Asia, they have a sign in hotels. It's one of those signs with a circle with the, with the not, mm. not allowed through it, the, the slash through it, and it's a it's a fruit called dorian. Yes, I've heard about that. Which is a big green thing, and it's it, mm. it it it's got these kind of like triangular protrusion or spiky protrusions all around it, and that's for the same reason is that the the ties they love it, but it gives off this smell that yeah people people don't like. How, do you know one of the things that I love this about? Scandinavia and it's also quite similar if you're in Portugal and Spain is that all you guys although the language is different in the in in the three countries you can all you can all get along in the same language you, you know you wouldn't like if you were in Sweden you wouldn't start talking English to be understood you you just oh, no. make do you just change your language or do they change theirs or how, do, how does no, that happen? No, we, we speak our own languages and Norwegians and Swedes and Danish people can understand each other. Uh, but interestingly enough, we, can, we have a very hard time understanding Icelandic, which is closest to our original language, right? So, uh, so that's, that's, that's how it is. But um, yeah, we... we I can speak with Swedish people just fine. Um, Danish is sometimes a little bit more difficult, but we don't speak English. Uh, we we uh, we keep our own languages, and and it's basically the same language. Uh, I would say there are parts of Norway where the dialect is so that I have a harder time understanding that than, for instance, Swedish. So. Uh, but I live very close to the Swedish border, and my 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 dialect is is actually it's it's extremely close to the written uh, language. Uh, you, you will find that in a few parts of Norway, people speaking um, as if you would read from a book, and I, I live in one of those parts actually. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's talk then about um should we talk about prepping first and then we'll talk we about that. that yeah mm -hmm. so what is the i mean i would imagine uh, people listening now may not even have heard the term prepping i'm only sort of fringe familiar with it because it it w when i hear the word prepping and even though, ironically, I think everybody should maybe be doing it at the moment. 
Um, but it conjures up images of these communities in America that take themselves away and live in the woods and they, they, they shun society and they want to keep their gut, their guns. Well, you know, quite, quite rightly. So if you ask me, um, mm. but they, they, it, does it, does it just mean to prepare for any eventuality? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, but if you look at, if we start by looking at governmental guidelines, uh, at least in Norway, they say that uh, the, uh, the, the Norwegian government says that you should keep what you need for uh, to survive on your own, well, without any assistance uh, and without electricity for three days. So already you can see that some prepping is recommended by the government. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to follow the government recommendations uh, uh, just because they, they are saying it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's right, but it is, uh, well, prepping is about being prepared so that you can uh, be, uh, you can survive and thrive uh, without assistance from the outside. And you, it's, you do have the doomsday preppers, um, uh, people imagining uh, a, a, you know, a, a walking dead zombie apocalypse uh, thing. Uh, and then you have also people who are a little bit down to earth and they might, you know, they might have experience being laid off uh, for a while, not having any work, uh, any job and, and uh, no income. Uh, so if, if you have a situation like that, it would obviously be good to have all, your, all the food that you need and other essential items for, let's say, you know, maybe a year. Uh, that gives you, that takes a lot of stress off your shoulders. Um, I, I myself, I think it's, it's more wise. It's wiser to have food than to have guns. <laughs> if I had to choose, but of course you, you know, um, I won't get into the gun thing here, but, uh, you know, social media, it's very sensitive about that. But, uh, so let's just, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, both is, uh, probably wise, but, um, prepping is also a mindset. I would say, uh, it's, it's, you, you will typically find people who want to be self-sufficient, not dependent on anyone else. Uh, you'll find those people in the prepping community, if we can call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think we do have a prepping community in Norway, but we certainly do have preppers here and there. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mindset, I would say. I mean, theoretically, in Norway, you'd stand a, a better chance of surviving something. Say, say if the smart grid went down and, and trucks stopped delivering food to, to supermarkets and this kind of thing, which is not actually, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we've had that in the UK this last two years. We've had like no food in the shops. And I mean, this is the UK. It's... I don't mean that there was nothing, but it started to get a bit, a bit concerning. Yeah. Funnily enough, the preppers in Britain, they only prepare themselves with toilet rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think they're going to, if they see a moose, they're going to throw the toilet roll really hard. Um, but in, of course, in Scandinavia, you have many log cabins, don't you, out in the nat nat well, or, or yeah. cab cabins out in the nature. I, I gather some of them are left open in case you you have an you know an emergency and and they yes. leave a they leave a match sticking out the box. So if your hands are cold, you can you can grab them the match and and they leave the fire ready to already kindled so you can light the fire. Um, yeah, well, I, that I have actually not seen, but uh, you, I, I guess you can find that. Um, and we do have a 
we, lots of those cabins scattered around in the wilderness here. We also have a wilderness, which is not, not all countries do have a wilderness. So um, in Norway, I would say actually, and I will say this, I will say this, there are people in Norway who might be into a form of hunting. I'm saying a form of hunting. <laughs> and they have this image of themselves surviving out in the wilderness if something happens. And because of that, they do not prep. But in my experience, those same people would not be able to survive out in the wilderness and they would not be able to hunt effectively. Uh, they don't know how to track animals. They don't know how to snare animals. They don't know any of those things. Now, when I've said that, snaring animals is not kind. Nobody should go do that for fun. That would be for a, an emergency, a real emergency. But, um, I mean, a place like Norway, you could walk from here and into Russia uh, you can walk from here from to, to the Pacific Ocean, actually. <laughs> uh, you could get properly lost forever um, because of our border to Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Mm. Um, so there certainly is uh, that possibility of living off the land. It's not for everyone. It would be very hard to do that. Uh, but it's, it is possible and i know that because people did that during the second world war and that's not that long ago um so um yeah again not for everyone but uh we should all and i'm saying this a lot on my my youtube channel is, uh, we should all store stock up on food now and the worst in worst, the worst case scenario is that you you bought some food uh, and you have some extra food that you're going to eat anyway, so you can't really lose actually. And uh, even you know, food prices go up. So you bought the food you will be eating is cheaper than if you were to go and buy it in in, in the stores, right? So yeah, I I say that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, I I think. Recent events have made me realise how society, in terms of the the, the shops, you know, the struck, it's quite fragile. Yeah, it, it wouldn't take a lot. I mean, you'd only need one chink in the armour. Um, so, say one company announced, you know, isn't going to make bread that week, and then suddenly people are buying another, and then suddenly they that factory can't make enough so this chain of events starts which would end up with people attacking the delivery trucks you know um just like waiting on the highway for a truck and right get that truck because people you, you can't starve to death we don't have much um nature like you guys do. I mean, we, you, you, you have bear and moose and salmon and, and, and trout. We, that is very limited here. Now we, we have salmon and trout, but the, the numbers are so small. Now um, we have a few sheep and, and cows, obviously, but I really can imagine a scenario where it, it wouldn't take a lot for people to start starving. And then, um, even going house to house to steal the, the the neighbor's food and this kind of this this kind of thing. Yeah, there's this saying that we're only nine meals away from anarchy. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, but yeah, I I think that uh, stealing would be uh, the first thing, and then you would have the violence, and then you would have. Um, uh, complete lawlessness, I guess. Uh, this idea of going out into the wilderness, uh, most people would not do that. That's just not, I don't see that happening because most of the year it's very cold. 
uh, most people do not have any experience in spending nights out in the under you know in in, in the woods and so on um, but um, yeah I mean Norway is very fragile when it comes to food because we don't have a national reserve of um, that uh, nothing to speak about uh, anyway uh, it's it's like it's very limited mm -hmm. so we are totally dependent on getting food into the stores every day or almost every day we haven't seen food shortage yet uh, but if that happens it will happen my guess is is that it will happen overnight suddenly it's we are in that situation and that could happen Absolutely. Yes, I think so. Yes, it's made me. I might. Have, I might have mentioned this, but it's made me think about at least stocking up on some basic items, even if it's just to get you through maybe a week, um, mm. or a week when you're when when all your groceries have 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 run out. Um. So yes. Yeah, so. That, that this this is what prepping is then and then of course i guess it's i guess it comes to the on the radar of the authorities because some of these um prepping communities they can like in the united states they don't like autonomy the government doesn't like people that can survive on their own um or that that make make their own sort of rules uh, am, am i right in thinking that beyond um you could be but i i i'm sitting here in norway so i try to be a little bit careful uh, when it comes to other countries i have been to the united states uh, three times but uh, so obviously that's it's it's very limited uh what i know about people in the United States and how things work there. Uh, it's, um, but I do think that at least in some parts, they are very much, no, it's, how should I put this? It's, um, I would say that Scandinavians and the British are more cold blooded than the Americans, in a way. So maybe that has something to do with the, the conflict, the level of conflict, maybe, uh, or the level of frustration. I am frustrated as well now. I, I, I am, absolutely. But, but I, I, I think also that, in Nor at least in Norway, the government is going to leave us in peace mostly uh, and if i wanted to live out in a log cabin on my own i could do that nobody would come and and uh, you know grab me and and say well no you're not allowed to stay here well, well if it was someone else's log cabin yes but <laughs> but um apart from that i would be uh, i would just that would be totally okay. Uh, but I, I see also that in the United States, there are some communities that start kind of looking like a militia uh, with lots of guns and so on. And yeah. that could be problematic, right? Because um, the potential for those communities to do harm is great. Um, it's it's or it's should I say it's it's not great. It's it is present um, in at least in the eyes of, of the United States uh, government. I would say so. Maybe there's a little bit of that going on. Maybe there's a bit of the you know the gun thing uh, that comes into the equation as well. I'm just guessing and thinking out loud here. Uh, I am not one of those people who are going, who are pointing at the Americans, laughing. Oh, look at you! You're obsessed by your guns because I, 
I, I used to not laugh at the Americans, but I used to be very, very skeptical about the whole thing. But now I understand there's a history behind that. They had to, they had to use violence to become a nation. And that we didn't have to do that here in Norway. Well, we, it almost came to that, but, um, so there's a history there. There's uh, there there are more going into that, but um, uh, and so I'm not going to say it's foolish to have guns. On the contrary, I would say, especially now, uh, I think it's may, might be wise. But um, <laughs> yes, yeah. well, the, the, mm. their constitution is actually very well written. It is. It you is. Know, it makes you wonder how they could have been so level-headed and, and selfless back then. Because yes. if you had the, the, the guys in charge writing it now, the, the guys I call the psychopaths, they'd basically write you into a, into a prison cell with, um, yes, shall we just yeah, say- It's quite that impressive the, that they were so for, foresighted, I think is, is mm -hmm. the word. They could see they could see if they weren't, then tyranny would be upon us all. And yeah. You know, my God, were they were they were they fortune tellers with a, a crystal ball, perhaps? Or maybe it's that what they were seeing is we are seeing the same now. It's because people don't really change. It's the same thing on and on and on. It's, uh, you know, human nature um, could be that. Mm. Bjorn, before we come to bushcraft, I just want to say Bjorn means bear, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> That's, it's quite a cool name. Is, it, is that it's cool a very name? common name here. Yeah. yeah, It's a very common name. Yeah. Is, is it nice to be, because you have, for, for friends at home, Norway still has native bears, so bears out in the wild. Um, yes, uh, not enough, if you ask me, not enough of them, but uh, yeah, we, we do have them, yeah. yeah. Mm. We, we have one bear in this country, it's Bear Grylls, I'm sure you, <laughs> you, you may have yeah. heard of him. Yeah, the guy on TV, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, what a cool name to be called Bjorn, Bear. Bushcraft, one of my favorite pastimes, although I'll hold my hand up and say what with doing all the YouTube and write, trying to write books and doing some adventuring here and there, I, I, I don't get to do it enough. I think I have about maybe five videos now on my channel, just some very basic bushcraft, some of which I've done with my son. Um, how did you get into it? Well, it started very early on when I was a child. And of course, we didn't call it bushcraft then. That was not a term here in, in Norway. But uh, I, I really like to spend time out in the woods, uh, you know, uh, uh, whittling and, and, and uh, making bows and arrows and stuff. Uh, that's That was quite normal back then in the 70s, early 80s. And um, and I must admit also, it, very, it was very exciting to start a fire. You know, we were not supposed to do that. But if you had a magnifying glass, you could. And, uh, uh, and that's kind of the start of my bushcraft career, so to speak. <laughs> I didn't burn down anything. No, no. But um, I... I then started in the... I was in the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. And then I went... Um, I went, uh, I went rogue, as they say, uh, and I started doing uh, more challenging stuff. Like that was in my teenage years, um, like surviving out, you know, in the winter with no sleeping bag and building shelters with a fire inside and stuff like that. Uh, and then I picked it up. Um, I guess about yeah, some years ago. It's been a while now, 
and uh, I got more into techniques that were new to me, like uh, friction fire and uh, and yeah, so, you know, bushcraft. There's you can learn something new every day. So that's that's one of the great parts, great things about it. Um, and I'm still learning. I'm still uh, a student of bushcraft, I would say. And I'm not an expert at all. I just find doing these things and succeeding after a while in learning new techniques, it's extremely rewarding, you know. And uh, Yes, I exciting. think... I think Bjorn, I think there's very few people out there that could actually survive and, and w without some form of modern day um, accoutrement or, you know, a blade or, or this. There are some videos, though, aren't there on YouTube of guys that actually go out into the nature and they do, they do, they go out with just a pair of shorts on. And yeah, you know they make a pot. They the pot you can't just make a clay pot. You you have to have the right clay, the cl like clean clay. You have to get rid of all the impurities, otherwise it cracks. And and they do this and they cook it. They cook the pot on the fire, and then that's their obviously for collecting the water. So that's the basics of survival covered. Um, yes, I think uh, we have a romantic vision of surviving in the nature that that in mm. in reality would be a lot harder yes uh it would be very hard um so but there's a huge difference uh between surviving with uh, you know just a few items and no no shelter nothing uh, and 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 surviving uh, if let's say you you have a log cabin out in the woods that's obviously a huge difference and um th that's why when it comes to again being prepared or preparedness having you know you know like a bug out bag is 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 wise uh, i think uh, because then you will you can grab a bag and have your essential items there, which makes everything a lot easier. Um, but uh, bushcraft is also, I would say, a great way of connecting with the past and learning to respect our ancestors and their way of life because they were no fools, you know. They were must have been very intelligent and resourceful uh, when you look at the things they did and how they managed so it's it's very impressive when I, when I look at it. Do you think the term bushcraft has become popular in modern culture because of Ray Mears? Yes, I'm a big fan of Ray Mears. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's not one of the um, uh, some of these. If you watch TV, some of these uh, people, they uh, everything is dangerous, and they're jumping off cliffs, and they uh, they do all sorts of stuff that you really shouldn't do in such a situation because that would get you hurt probably. Now, Ray Mears is very mellow and he knows his stuff. And uh, I hope Ray Mears is not listening to this, but uh, there's this saying, I, I read that somewhere, uh, you should always trust a, uh, a, a fat bushcrafter. <laughs> I was going to say, I wouldn't trust him around my donuts. <laughs> yeah, well, um, but uh, in my experience, um, you know, you ne need to take things easy out there in the, in the wild. So I, when I hike, I don't like to walk very fast. Uh, and I, I try to observe what's going on around me. I take a lot of breaks and I try to be comfortable uh, all the time. Uh, I like that, and uh, uh, I, I think that's having that mindset is healthy, also from a uh, survivalist uh, standpoint. Yes, energy is your enemy, 
if mm. you're ever in any kind of survival situation, isn't it? Because you, you only have, I once went 18 days without food. Wow. Um, on the 17th day, I ran two miles. I just wanted to see if you can still run after fasting for such a long time. Um, for friends listening, it was a great experience. It's, there's, I've, I've actually, I think I've done a video on, on, on fasting and it's, it's absolutely nothing to do with body image, losing weight, et cetera, et cetera. It's about getting in touch with our ancestry who, as we're, as we're hearing now, probably would have had to go for periods of their life without food, um, in times of scarcity, mm. bad weather, drought, famine, this kind of stuff. So I think because it's built into our DNA to be able to go for such long periods, I think it also has some sort of purifying um, effects on the mind and, and the body. But that's another, another subject. Um, what um for young people listen i i'm a big advocate bjorn that that you, you you've got to get outdoors you know you've got to light a, i mean we as youngsters we were always we, we would like would go into the nature we'd light a fire um camping all, all this kind of stuff what what can we say um because I do worry that some young people who watch my show, if all they do is just play the Xbox, go to the job, come back, play the Xbox again, they're going to get old and then look, look back on their life and, and never have connected with nature. Yeah, well, that, that's not a good life, is it? No. Uh, it's not a real life. It's an it's a very artificial life, and um, uh, people need to get out in the real world. That that's 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 what I always say. And the real world is not the cities; uh, it's uh, it's the wilderness. Uh, that's reality, and uh, most other things are very artificial. Um. So, I think, uh, you know, and I get this uh, question a lot because people are asking, what should I do to get out in the wilderness or to get connect with nature and so on? Um, well, the obvious answer is, well, just get out there. <laughs> but there's a lot of people who are actually afraid. Uh, so... People will ask me things like, uh, are you not afraid of the predators? Um, and uh, yeah, I guess in some countries there are. Are they, are they, talking, are they talking about the government now? <laughs> well, uh, well, I think actually they talk about uh, wolves and bears and stuff, but uh, and uh, it's... <sighs> So it's it's actually quite difficult to explain to people that well you it's not like on TV where people they they uh, survival shows they almost die in every scene you know it's it's not like that um, now nature can be cruel nature can be brutal nature can be all things but mostly nature is quiet it's quiet. Uh, and you go out there and that you 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 hear that silence and you you start connecting with yourself through connecting with nature should i say that's a, a very profound thing when that happens and you really have to experience that to understand what what it's about you never get that silence when you're constantly bombarded with, uh, you know, the, the people talking, uh, advertisements, social media, uh, your job tasks, um, uh, Xbox games, and uh, 
you never it's not healthy if you ask me it's not healthy to live that way no so how can we in, um, what advice can we give to young people um, if they want if they fancy you know if they want to get in touch with themselves and, and get in touch with the wilderness um, I, I, I'd say get a pen knife even better if you can afford a bushcraft knife and just go and chop some sticks and you know camp overnight something something like this yeah well I've I've thought about that and I used to say camp overnight spend the night outside um, but now I'm saying that I think what you should do is uh, bring some food and uh, a knife uh, some matches um, and, and <laughs> you don't have to use the bow drill to, to start a fire you know so <laughs> uh, and, and you go for a walk at a campsite or, and if you're not allowed in your country to, to camp where you want so then you go to a campsite and you build a little fire there and you have your food and you just sit there for a while then you can go back home if you want to. Next time, you can go a little bit further. You can walk a little bit further. You can maybe, you know, uh, have some uh, sausages on a stick, you know, uh, on, on the fire. Uh, next time again, maybe you can go out with some friends, spend the night in a hammock or a tent, um, and so on and so on, and progress from there. Uh, it becomes a habit and it becomes also a lifestyle, I would say. Yes. I'd say for friends listening, it, it, I would just drive out somewhere and then probably not go too far from the car for the, and, until I was, you know, it's always quite nice to be near the car anyway, because then you don't, you don't have to carry so, so much stuff, <laughs> but, but, Having said that, I have done um, 70 kilometer marches um, camping overnight. That, that was in Iceland, actually. That was a wonder, wonderful trek. Um, let's finish, Bjorn, by talking about fire by friction. Yeah, that's, that's great fun. <laughs> yes, I'm going to, one second. I've never managed to do it in the nature. So I resorted to buying one of these kits on eBay. You're going to hate me now. No, 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 not at all. But just, I just wanted the experience of actually achieving it because, um, I mean, I haven't tried it a massive amount of times, but I've probably given it a go about three, three times. Yeah. I have very limited knowledge which would for the base and which would for the, for the spindles. Um, so I thought buy a kit, it's going to be easy, right? Nah, just as hard with this. In the end, I actually put the spindle in my uh, electric drill. Yeah. And when <laughs> for about 30 seconds, I got a huge, um, what I thought was an ember. And it's mm. smoking away. And as soon as I tapped it into the tin, there's nothing that is gone. <laughs> so what, what are our thoughts on this? Well, it takes a lot of practice. Uh, I did not have any instruction. And I, uh, I don't think I have ever seen anyone in Norway do it. I'm not saying nobody in Norway has ever done it before I did it. <laughs> I'm sure there are someone, but, but I haven't seen it here. Uh, so I had to research the wood, the sorts of wood to use. And then I found out that because of the climate here, it's different because the wood is harder. The same wood in England, for instance, and Norway, uh, you, you'll find normally that the wood, that same wood is harder in Norway. So I had to... Um, uh, just try out what works and what doesn't work and uh, I finally made it um, and I have actually stayed 
with those types of wood and I have made a kit that I, I don't think there is any shame at all in bringing your bow drill kit because I think they did that back then as well. Um, they would bring their uh, fire making kit with them as they were traveling and so on. Um, of course, it's good practice to make new ones, but but yeah, it is. It just takes it. It takes a bit of practice. I found that how well your 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 stance uh, when you use the bow drill has a lot to do with it. Uh, all these little details they make a huge difference. So don't don't give up. I I think I must have tried like uh, fifty times or something like that before I I finally got an ember that was. Uh, kept uh and uh, and started glowing so um yeah it's it's great fun but i i haven't mastered the hand drill yet so i'm trying to find the right v sort of wood for that uh it's um it's a bit challenging here i have to tell you that the hand drill because the wood is so hard so yeah <laughs> And even when you find the right wood, it, it's going to take all the skin off your hands. It's a... Yeah, well, I, I've heard that you can, you can actually take some um, um, spruce uh, sap in your hands to make them sticky so that they don't slide down the, the spindle that easily. Uh, so, but... You can do that, but as I said, I have I have not yet, as per today, uh, as we are recording this, I haven't mastered the hand drill, which is a bit uh, embarrassing, but uh, I'll get there. I'll get there. And the reward will be uh, even greater the, the more effort you put into it. You know? Definitely, definitely. And is that, is that a bow I see behind you? Oh, it's uh, yeah. Well, it's one of those modern bows uh, with the uh, the wheels on it. So, yeah, I have one of those as well. They, it it is more accurate than the than the long bows. Mm -hmm. And yeah. is bow hunting legal in Norway? Because it's a it's illegal here. Yeah, it's it is illegal here. Um, and. Uh, my experience with the local hunters here tells me that uh, it's it's really it's that's probably wise, but um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do have one of those. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the problem would be is that you could injure injure an animal and then it's it's got to run away and die. Yes. Um, yes. And yeah, it is um, it is less accurate than a rifle, but the problem with hunting here, of course, is that there are lots of people, sadly, uh, who will sit there and drink and uh, behave in a way that hunters should not behave, should I say, yeah. Yes. So I, I have a problem with that in my local woods, actually. Uh, it's a big problem. Yes, I guess times are changing. But because in in the UK we have something called the country code, mm. and it's quite an old. I mean, it goes back years and years, and and you can actually find it written, like on say a government or a, a government website or a. Um, like say a nature website and it's because people have to be told not to drop your litter. You know, you drink your beer, you, you can't just yeah. throw the can on the ground. And this is a real problem here. Yeah. Here as well. And especially during hunting season, or should I say at the height of the hunting season, uh, I will always find uh, empty beer cans, vodka bottles and all sorts of rubbish uh in uh, at at the campsites uh here in the local woods which makes me think that i mean it's it doesn't happen 
it only happens during the hunting season, so you can draw your own conclusions there. But uh, drinking, sitting there and drinking uh, bottles of vodka and hunting is is not a good combination, if you ask me. Yes, I think times are perhaps changing as well because I don't think you would have had to tell people 50 years ago not to just throw your vodka bottles in the forest. Oh, it can start a forest fire as well. Yeah. If, if it I just mean there. it's, it's, it, it's mm. maybe a, new, a newer thing. Pe- people are losing touch with the importance of the nature. Yeah, well, I've, had, I've heard people, grown-up men, talking about playing hunting on their computer games, like the, I don't know, the Xbox, so I don't know what these things are called, but yeah, and it's all, and then you can go out in the woods and you can and shoot, uh, hunt, and so on, play there as well, and it's like there's something wrong with these people. And I don't like to call them hunters because in my mind, a hunter is someone who, with a certain code of ethics, uh, that's how I want to envision a hunter. Uh, these people are nothing like that. Uh, so that's, that's a problem. And, and yeah, maybe it was different before. I don't know. Um, it certainly is not as it should be now. And Bjorn, just to finish off, I think we should actually talk about some bushcraft. Can you give us um, some sort of examples, maybe when, when, you, when you're going on a trip, what are you going to put in your, in your pack? When- well, I go lightweight. So I do not bring a lot of stuff. Um, I, the bushcraft items I will bring is a good knife, a folding saw, and if it's during the winter, an axe. Uh, not a big axe, but a... Uh, here's this one, you know, like something like this. Um, and some string uh, as well so that yeah for obvious reasons uh, I I will bring a tarp and I think that's yeah and a little um, tin with uh, some uh, cotton balls with uh, petroleum jelly because that's that's a great fire starter uh, that's the bushcraft items I will bring. And um, with those tools, you can do almost everything. You can build shelters. You can um, obviously g- gather firewood and uh, build like a, a heat reflecting wall and stuff. And you can be very comfortable with those items and, what, uh, and make a great camp. Uh, in winter, I prefer to have a, um, you know, like the tarp behind in some kind of configuration and uh, the fire in front of me. Uh, that's, uh, and I make a long fire or a, typically a, a Siberian long fire or a Siberian log fire. Um, that's my, fa- those two are my favorites. Uh, they keep you warm for a long time. Mm. And, um, yeah, so let's say, uh, let's see, a uh, knife, saw, uh, axe, uh, string, tarp, and a tin with uh, some uh, fire starting material. Uh, yes, and a f- also I bring uh, a ferro rod. Um, and if I'm hiking for some distance, uh, some uh, storm matches. Um, you know, uh, you shouldn't leave those behind back home because if you know, if you're in a hurry, if it's if you get injured, if something happens, you really want the easiest way to start a fire. Mm. Storm matches are they the big matches that they burn for quite a lot? The, they've got a lot of powder on them. Yeah, they're not. They're not. I think they're like this, but they are. Um, 
they, you know, I think you can almost light them under water. <laughs> I haven't tried, <laughs> but they will yeah. uh, stay we to, burning. Um, for we used to get them in our military ration packs. Okay. Used to get like a stick of maybe five in e each pack. Hmm. And are you taking any kind of uh, sleep sleep roll? Uh, yeah, of course. I, yeah, my sleeping bag is here. Um, which, which, so, bra which brand are they? Uh, I use the CPAX uh, because they are lightweight and good quality and uh, not made in China, which is a topic in itself. But um, yeah, I use CPAX. Uh, and uh, a, a uh, sleeping pad as well. And um, do you ever use a, a bivy bag? I haven't. Well, yes, I, I have many years ago. Uh, I used to hike with a bivy bag when I was like in my when I was a teenager. Um, I still have that one, but um, yeah, I don't use that anymore. I use a tent now. Yes. And did I see a Jungilac? That, that was a Norwegian brand, was it? Yeah. A Jungilac. Yeah. Uh, it, is it Norwegian? Um, either Norwegian or Swedish. But, but I think they've sold out. They sold out. To I, I would have to check. I'm not sure, but... In I general, think. you will see that the Norwegian brands are not Norwegian anymore. Yeah. They're not yeah. produced or manufactured in Norway, and they are not owned by Norwegian people. So, uh, But I don't know if that goes for Ayungulak in particular. Uh, yeah, I saw that they'd been bought out by Mammut, which I think was a traditionally a German company. Okay. Um, because I tried to buy one because I know they're the best sleeping bags in the world. Um, Scandinavian equipment is just so well made. Uh, it is. Um, but for me now, it gets too heavy. Uh, again, I don't like to carry heavy, a heavy backpack. So uh, some people don't mind, but um, I go lightweight and that excludes most of the Norwegian brands mm. or the, the formerly, the, the brands that used to be Norwegian. And I've seen you eating what looked like um, the pre-prepared rations, the ones you just put in maybe hot water. Yeah, yeah. Is that your favorite technique or, or do you mix it um, up? Yeah, well depends on how far i'm hiking uh, i will normally bring some of those because they again they are lightweight you only need to add water and it's simple and tasty uh, you get uh, quite a lot of calories in, in those uh, so I, I i i like those yeah i if i'm not hiking for very far i will bring some you know fresh meat and bacon and uh, things like that Mm, wonderful mm. Bjorn listen it has been a fascinating chat thank you ever so much well thank you oh, absolutely my pleasure it would be my dream that we could maybe meet up one day and, and, and get out in the woods together that would be nice absolutely it would be, a, be a, bro, a bro date I think we can call it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, ha, do you have any books out Bjorn I do have uh, several, uh, but uh, none of those are in English. Uh, as per today, I hope my agent will be able to secure, uh, you know, uh, a good book deal mm -hmm. with uh, English or American, an English or American uh, publisher. That hasn't happened yet, but uh, my website, uh, that's the... Cesar, B U L L hyphen H A N S E N dot com. Uh, on the page that you, if you, if you write that and you go to that page, uh, it, there's a list there of which languages my novels are available in. And I, I update 
That's when you, when you uh, say no, novels, do you mean fiction? Or yes, or, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to put your website below the YouTube video, and also, Wonderful. also your amazing YouTube channel. You have a lot of subscribers now, hey? Uh, yeah, we, we. I say we. Uh, it's only me, so I should I. I should say I. I crossed the uh, four hundred and forty-two thousand subscriber mark uh, today um it's uh, so yeah that's i guess that's those are people i think the interest in bushcraft because the bushcraft channels on youtube are just the biggest they they get so many views um, yeah i think that is a representation of how many people are looking for something else in their lives because they're unhappy with, you know, maybe their job or the, the, they're just playing the Xbox all the time or whatever. And I think they, they look to guys like you and think, wow, I, I wish I was doing what this guy was doing. Yeah, well, also, I think that during the last year and a half, uh, lots of people have been... I've not been able to go out and spend the night in the wilderness and so on, so so that they, you know, at least they can watch some videos from someone out in the woods, um, and hopefully that has helped people. Uh, I think so. So there's that as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest, and I'm I'm makes me glad, you know. People are interested in bushcraft and connected with, connecting with nature. Uh, that's a good thing. Yes, definitely. Bjorn, just stay on the line and when I, I hit, the, hit the record off, just so I can thank you properly. Um, to our friends at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. Uh, get out into the nature as often as you can because it's... Um, Good for the head and good for the heart. And if you could like and subscribe um, and check that you're still subscribed, because apparently YouTube just unsubscribes people from my channel, that would be wonderful. That leads me to say one last thing. Hardy bra. Hardy bra.